Some kids say that racing games are a dying breed. Okay, then why am I still seeing them if it's so-called dying breed? I think it's still popular, no matter how simple it looks. It's a thing that anyone can pick up and play, albeit with some exceptions. Then again, that kind of applies to most genres. Okay, I'm not sure where to go with that. But when Sony entered the console gaming ring, the community will point at them and laugh as this is a much different ball game than selling Walkmans and televisions. When they released their little great console late 1994, they meant serious business. Who could forget the classics such as Castlevania Symphony of the Night, Chrono Trigger, Tekken, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Crash Bandicoot, Siphon Filter, Spyro, and Hooters Road Trip. Jokes aside, what about that one racing game that outsold all of them? You know what I'm talking about. With the recently released seventh installment of the series, Today's episode will send you back to the past, all the way to the beginning. We're going in our Toyota Supras, Mitsubishi FTOs, Snek GTS, and our dubiously named concept cars. We'll be blazing through the city streets of Route 5, batter our way through Trial Mountain, cross the bridge of Grand Valley, and mostly fail that one chicane in Route 11. So without further ado, ladies, gents, trans, and evil maniacs, welcome to the Lost Legends, Gran Turismo's real beta simulator. But before we start, I have to plug in this dumb thing. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, follow the white rabbits, algorithm. Also join my discord. Alright, let's start. As the legends begin, we go back to the past. And there was a man named Kazunori Yamauchi. Before he was the Gran Turismo man, he was just some guy working with Sony Music Japan as part of a small video game group for them Nintendos and Segas. Yeah, Sony was in the gaming business since the late 80s to early 90s. Anyhow, when the PlayStation was in development, the Sony group was at the forefront to make games for it, naturally. And Kaz got to work on some ideas for games in the third dimension. He came up with a whopping 100 potential game titles. Yes, 100. And all of them are rejected by the board. It's unknown what the 100 ideas were planned to be, but it's safe to say that a game that's going to be Gran Turismo is amongst them. Despite the ideas rejected, the Sony executives tasked Kaz and his new team at Polly's Entertainment to make a racing game that compete with the likes of... Super Mario Kart. This Mario Kart clone eventually became Motor 2 Grand Prix, and it's one of the PlayStation's Japanese launch titles. And yes, it was Japanese exclusive. Safe to say that this game was less carty to put in perspective when I first played this. But it's not bad for their first game on the new platform. Its sequel was released worldwide in 1996, and it is more of a kart racer this time around. Motor 2 Grand Prix 2 is an improvement on the original, featuring some refinements, additional goodies, and three minigames. One of which we'll be talking about is Motor 2 Grand Prix R. Motor 2 GPR is quite distinct from the others, because it's not a clone of some property, but a racing sim of sorts. It features two cars, the MT196R, an F1, and the MTG7000, a stock car. There is only one course which is just Motor 2 Island, but without power-ups and a less saturated coat of paint. One thing I'd like to point out is that I didn't use any patches. The gameplay here is running at a full 60 FPS. This will be the early basis of what's going to be their next game. Oh wait, you think this track layout isn't familiar? Let me show you. You may be thinking that Motor 2 Grand Prix is where it started. No. It didn't start after Motor 2 Grand Prix or its sequel. It actually started in mid-1992 in secret, with only five developers started working on the project. 
They made the Motor 2 Grand Prix games just to convince the executives a little easier since they weren't interested in that kind of race that Gran Turismo was supposed to be. Well, luckily, those games are quite successful. These games may look like just some other racer on the surface, but, but it's the foundation of what GT would eventually become. One thing to point out is a simple term of pitch documents. The usual pitch document can be a lengthy one, like several pages with extensive detail. So for example, D-Main Design's Racing Chase, which later became Grand Theft Auto, contains some ideas and info about the title. This includes system requirements, conception, scope, graphics, gameplay, and development time. So what did Kaz do to pitch Gran Turismo? So you expect this car nerd to slap down a book that says Gran Turismo, the real pitch document simulator. But in reality, all it takes was a single sentence. And it says, I want to drive my car on my television. Based. Okay, there's a little bit more than just a one sentence pitch. There's also a pitch demo we never saw. And I only know this by a documentary with Shue Yoshida describing the prototype. He mentions the car's reflective mapping, the amazing physics, the graphics. Completely impressed by what he's seen, they gave your boy Yomiuchi the green light and then eventually, the production begins at full swing. The development for this game was hell. Some members in the polyphony office just lived there, and they felt like there's no end in sight. The problem was the PlayStation hardware, despite being a new piece of tech at the time, couldn't handle some of its initial plans. They have a scrap race with 12 cars, some sound designs compromised, and to optimize, they had to use assembly code. Now I don't want to go into the extensive detail of what the assembly code is, but saying primitive is an understatement. Then again, that sounds like a horror story by someone who got out of EA or Ubisoft. But this was their reality for five years. Their blood, sweat, and tears spent just to make this one game. And not to mention, the development time at this length was rarely heard of back then. And this brings in another question. Was it worth it? From mid-1992 to December 23rd, 1997, started from a handful of devs to around 15 after Moto 2 Grand Prix 2, a name change of a studio, and probably smelly office, the legendary racing franchise was born. Gran Turismo is a game that was something special back in 1997 to 1998. I think you already know what Gran Turismo is, coming from that slogan. It's a racing sim. You kids may be thinking that this boring racing game that lacks Lamborghinis and Ferraris will be a big flop according to George Wood. If Sony had spent half the time on the game as they did on the enclosed booklets, Gran Turismo wouldn't be the flop that it is. Joke's on him. This is the game that outsold Final Fantasy VII, and its sequel outsold Final Fantasy VIII. The first game sold over 10 million copies, making it the best-selling game for the console. To play Gran Turismo is simple. Start simulation mode, go through the TD's license test just to get to the main races, then buy your first car which has the highest amount of buff horses for the low 10k price. Don't lie to me, you've done this before. And slowly you win races with that thing. Upgrade your car, stick a racing flywheel into it, take on a tournament, and win an A-Spec Demio. Next is probably grind some more races for cash, win some, lose some, sell some, tune some, and win another tournament to get yourself a race car. If you're brave enough, we all try to do an endurance race, take on some tougher races, and so on and so forth. Maybe I'm exaggerating just a bit. This could apply to most GT games. But in the first installment of Gran Turismo, it's primitive. There's no real world tracks, no rally mode despite having some rally cars, physics can be a bit wonky at times, and the tedious procedure of being asked to qualify before a race. Also, all the event races are in the tournament format. So yeah, it's a racing sim that a few other games have done before. However, one distinction from its contemporaries is the list of cars. Over 180 exactly. The cars range from regular sedans, K cars, hatchbacks, coupes, sports cars, aftermarket tuners, concept cars, rally and race cars, all made in three countries. In Gran Turismo standards, it's quite low. 
but for racing games prior to GT and while after, over 100 cars is unheard of, and it's on the PlayStation. To give you a car count on other racers at the time, NASCAR 98 got 26 cars, Need for Speed 3 Hot Pursuit had 32 cars, Midnight Club had 43, Revolt with Dreamcast and Demo exclusive cars had 58, and Carmageddon with the Splat Pack had 60. Yeah. Another notable distinction was the arcade mode. The physics are a bit altered, speeds faster, handling's tighter, and some of the track's terrain are tweaked for the sake of having them jumps. This is only exclusive to the first game. The sequels retain the sim physics and tracks remain unaltered. So I just gave you the bare bases. But do you want to know what it's like before the game's released? There are six different builds to the game featuring differences that are distinct from one another. The earliest build to the public is from August 2nd, 1997, known as the Test Drive Disc. Then, Preview V1 a month later. The Trial Demo from October 27th, following up with the Store Demo on November 3rd. Then Preview V2 10 days later. And lastly, combining the various demos from the US and UK in late 1997 to March 1998. There's one I've missed which is the earliest build we know, which is dated a couple days earlier than the test drive build. The only difference was having the option to change colors on the used cars. In this episode we'll cover the major differences, because if I talk about the cars then this episode will be an average video essay. That being too damn long. So let's begin with the earliest build and go our way from there. The differences start right out of the gate with a replay, or playback as this game calls it, and then we meet a much different menu screen. No background, just blackness and the GT logo. Selecting cars in arcade mode doesn't have the manufacturer logos, and the track selection had a bigger map layout without the FMV. The cars lacked the class rank, some had different colors, and both Chevrolet and Aston Martin can't be accessed since they're not implemented yet. The only playable cars are the Honda NSX and the Rice King Civic, and the only track available in the demo is High Speed Ring. Even though the demo shows 8 out of the 11 tracks, you can access all of them with the Game Shark. Many of the tracks in this demo only have minor differences, most of them are just signs and stuff. Some standout differences between this build and the final is High Speed Ring Skybox which was planned to take place at dusk instead of midday. The only major difference in terms of track layout was Grand Valley, where there is an extended section just before the bridge. Makes sense, because this version makes the famous bridge section much smaller. The overall gameplay is a bit off, and there's no countdown or other race jingles. The in-game HUD is a bit minimal, lacking the total time, total records, and even the in-game map. Oh, and don't set your controller to analog, because you can't even move if that's on. The GT mode in the demo is fairly limited, the license and machine tests aren't made yet, and you can only access the Toyota dealership. The dealership had a different menu interface, the new car lineup is in a list format, and the car you're about to buy lacked a little light plate or the car's logo. The used car dealership also had a different screen, but it's just a background. Its lineup is in the same list format, just like the previous, but the final version had a different interface. The biggest difference in GT mode are the tuning shops. In the final version, plus all the other GT games, you go to the tune shop and purchase parts for your car. In the test drive version, you're able to buy parts for a specific car, according to this bit from the cutting room floor. This likely explains a game quirk. If you buy a car and later obtain another instance of the same model of the car, all non-permanent tuning parts are marked as purchased ready to equip in other instances of the same model. If that's the case, then the tune shops would be redundant if you bought every single part for all cars. Also, this is a very clunky design. The replay demo had a few demonstrations featuring tracks you can't play without a Game Shark. Unlike the other builds which had technical info, this one shows a name and brief description. Um, yeah, that's it. Unlike the other builds, this one isn't dubbed to the public yet. One of the most recent finds is this here preview build, also known as Preview V1. 
This is dated around September according to Matt J. This had the final menu screen but only two options, Quick Arcade and Gran Turismo. The arcade only had the single race available on the easy difficulty. Unlike some builds, you could access all of the cars with some exceptions like the 67 Corvette. That also means that the Dodge Concept car uses the early Copperhead title. Why the change isn't on Polyphony but on Dodge and Chrysler, because some ZZ Top member trademarked the name to his custom Ford. Which isn't copper by the way. There's an editor's side note on the screen to read through this. Back on topic, the tracks too are all accessible and is close to the final. The track layout is smaller with red dots, indicating checkpoints which will be seen in later builds. The track preview FMV plays differently too. Also what Matt has missed is that Grand Valley still has the beta layout. The HUD is closer to the final, gameplay is a bit better, and one thing to show is the camera transitions if you change the car view. The later builds plus subsequent games don't have that. Also, do you know about the famous 3-2-1 go sound? Oh, you know this? It would have been different if they kept that. So what about GT mode? Actually, you can't access Gran Turismo in Gran Turismo. The follow-up video by Matt J with the help of a friend will show you its features. Links in the description. This demo had the early intro which lacked the credits. Quick Arcade had a different background, and you can't access most of its features but the options, replay theater, and single race. The only playable car in track is the 1997 Honda NSX in high speed ring with the demo time that lasts 90 seconds. The GT mode screen is finalized, and you can access anywhere besides the Toyota dealership. However, Toyota is the only dealership available in this demo, and inside the lineup is close to the final but the cars had a different pose. They have their own logos and the tune shop is finalized, UI wise. Oh wait, you can't buy anything here because you're flat broke. It's a demo exclusive to Japanese stores at the time, taking place sometime around the Trial and Preview V2 builds. Unlike the Trial, you can access all of the cars and tracks, but nothing else. You can't even access the GT mode because of the store demo. There's also no timer so you can finish the races properly. The last build before the final Japanese retail release is in November 13th, a good two weeks before the final build. The main menu is finalized apart from the line of text knowing who developed this. The arcade mode still had the earlier background. You can access everything in arcade mode, even the end credits in GT Hi-Fi mode. No Hi-Fi mode doesn't make it pretty, but it made to play a few tracks in 60fps. Some notable instances is this debug text at the bottom right corner just below the speedometer. But if you pause it... Whoa... What is all that? It shows you the car's parameters and stuff. GT mode is closer to the final, but the difference being how much cash you start, which is 100 million credits. Keep this in mind that this is meant for journalists. One notable car in GT is the notoriously priceless Dodge Concept car, but in this build you can buy 10 of them if you want to. One oddity is Route 11 in Hi-Fi mode. It doesn't have their own track layout, but if you listen closely, it's Moon Over the Castle being played in the background. So you may think that's the last build, but there is one more that was in late 1997 to March 1998, the UK and US demo discs. Yeah, these kind of vary whether or not GT mode is inaccessible or had a damn timer on it. But in terms of builds, this is probably the preview V2 disc from earlier. These lacked an intro movie, and in arcade mode you have a unique manufacturer called Available Cars. The others are accessible, but the cars cannot be selected. The only playable cars are the Acura NSX, 
the 96 Corvette, and probably the Subaru Impreza rally car. The only available track is either High Speed Ring or Clubman Route 5, but the preview is only a static black and white image in place of the FMV. Gameplay is the same, but if you're playing on the Pizza Hut demo, there's no in-game music at all. There's also some replay demos where it shows off Clubman Route 5 and Trial Mountain. In GT mode, you can access all of the dealerships, but despite the enough cash to buy a Truno, you can't buy anything else. Also, I think it's an early localization version. Some prices remain their Japanese scale, like this Viper costing 7 million credits instead of around 70k. In other words, it's a stripped down Preview V2 version made to fit in a Pizza Hut demo CD or a cover disc. Now let's get into some of that pre release stuff. You know why you're here, so where were you? I told you. You don't want to change your story. No. I took a TVR Cerbera. Ran the Nissan Skyline and a Toyota Supra. That's right. And you spun the TVR. Yes! There's no record of a missing TVR or a crash with a Skyline or a Supra that night. Do you want to change your story? I hope you like heads because we got some. A couple commercials stated that the game has 166 cars. However, in the final game it has a total of a little over 180. Likely underestimating the count. Heck, I had to rewrote the script because I said there's 140. In the official trailer from the official PlayStation UK magazine volume 12, it shows an early build dated around the trial version. The Dodge concept car is still Copperhead, the GT mode features a different Go Racing license icon, and the dealerships are unfinished shown here. Another trailer shows gameplay but the physics are much crazier, where cars bounce around, driving on two wheels and this Subaru was sent flying. This is the part where I have to mention a glitch in the Japanese version, where you drive a four wheel drive car to a wall at a certain angle, it gains speed rapidly. Yeah. The real driving simulator. In one of the PlayStation Underground demos with the making of Gran Turismo, you can spot an ancient white and red Gran Turismo logo on the TV screen. However, that might not be the case because how the camera was shot and how they see CRTs, meaning that this bit is pointless. Another piece of unique content is this here press disc meant for Sony executives. On disc 3, it contains Gran Turismo content. It features some images, screenshots, and a potato quality video. But I'm not going to show said video because it's just the same replays from the test drive version. One more is this magazine ad from the June 1998 issue of GamePro Magazine. Good stuff. I want you to take a look at this and probably find some differences between this and the final. In Gran Turismo, there's some unused content and oddities, like having a droppable license plate, Gran Turismo logo, and a trophy. These aren't intended to be their own vehicles, and its main purpose is to show the player that they accomplished something. These can be accessed by using the Game Shark. There isn't much of actual cut vehicles, but there's plenty of beta versions of cars within the early builds. A lot of these are minor or just placeholders. So here's some cars with major changes. These are from the test drive disc, by the way. There are two interesting models I want to show you. The Celica GT4 originally had a red and white color scheme, until it was changed to resemble the ST205 GT4 rally car in the final. Also, the spoiler was more boxy. Lastly and opposingly, the Subaru Impreza rally car was planned to resemble the real WRC version. Also, the name was originally called the Subaru WRX WRC to hammer on the point. Probably licensing issues, so they altered the livery a bit, along with adding an alternate black color scheme. For cars that aren't just altered models, the notable one is the racing modified version of the Dodge Concept car. This one is not only the one car that can't be purchased, but the only stock model not eligible to be racing modified, or all tuning except the tires. 
However, the racing modification was planned as shown on the preview V2 disc, but cut at the last minute. The racing modification made its way in the sequel, complete with LM variant. Next is the entire Plymouth brand. Well, the one car that matters. The Prowler. This would have been the only retro style roadster in the game if it was implemented. But how do I know it's going to be the Prowler? It was in a documentation of the test drive build that it was planned, but I guess it went nowhere and what remains is the brand's logo. It's a shame because the car would have been a standout addition alongside the concept car. Then again, the Plymouth brand made its way to its sequel, featuring the Cuda, Superbird, and the Roadrunner. But the Prowler didn't make its way until Gran Turismo 4, and by then it's a Chrysler model. Another, which is a mystery, is the entire Lotus brand. More so, the Elise. This only appeared in the preview V1's TVR dealership for some reason. Could be by mistake, as both Lotus and TVR are British car brands. Now speaking of early builds. There's a couple unused graphics in the retail depicting race model, racing special, and just plain special. In the test drive build using cheats to show all cars, then you notice that one of them is used at one point. So what were they? Well, I'm just guessing here in that race model stands for racing modifications, like most of your stock cars after you apply them. Racing special is likely one literally made to race, like the Castro Supra, Viper GTSR, and that Subaru Legacy. Lastly, special models could be the aftermarket tuning cars, like the TRD 3000 GT and Nismo 400R, and concept cars like the concept car. Another unused piece is for the HUD and that's the turbo and fuel gauges. Turbo cars exist in GT, but the turbo gauge would make its way into Gran Turismo 2, complete with that sound. <laughs> the fuel system on the other hand never made its way until Gran Turismo 4. Next, for unused tracks, we don't have much. In the final game we have Rogo Test, which is just Autumn Ring Mini but the cars are ridiculously shiny. And End which is a circular course planned for the end credits. My guess is that this one's once planned as an in-game scene where the car drives itself around a circle, while the camera points at the scenery as the credits scroll down. The arcade mode had unused thumbnails for the tracks. Instead of the small FMV and map you'll usually see, it's going to have static images with their names on them. One thing that's revealing is the early name for Grand Valley Speedway which was once Prawn Speedway, in Clubman Stage Route 5 is SS Route 5 Short. There's only 8 out of the 11 made, and one notable thing is the PlayStation ads all over the place. Which in all the builds we've shown, there's not a single one. It could be replaced by the game's logo, but who knows. Back in the test drive version of Gran Turismo is this early logo. This was replaced way early in the development process, likely after the pitch demo. It's pair basic, shows the name, subtitle of driving simulation game, and a checkerboard. All the tracks that featured the logo was replaced by the final alternate version. Some tracks in the final didn't remap the sign properly, so it looks off. Another cut feature that made its way into later games is the wheel shop. Yeah, you have a plethora of rims to choose from, but only comes in either white, gray, or red. One more thing that will blow your socks off is an unused mode that never saw the light of day until the fifth installment, Drift School. Deja Vu. Yes, Gran Turismo was planned to have a drift mode since the beginning, but never materialized. Yeah, you ever wonder why you have the option to either have racing or drift specs in arcade mode? Then here's your reason. This was discovered by GT fanatic Submaniac93, who managed to rip a lot of assets out of the full game. This menu in particular was shown in the preview V1 build shown by Matt. If you want to know more about that unused Gran Turismo stuff, I'll lead you to him. He makes good stuff. You know, I don't know how I end things. But making a passion project led by some guy who worked on the Keith Richards of Gran Turismo and making a racing juggernaut is impressive. Not only as a video game, but in the real life too. Kaz competed in the Nürburgring by the way and won twice. Okay, I do need a little more detail. Gran Turismo 1 has set the groundwork with their innovations. 
The progression, the customization, the physics, and the graphics is what kept this game afloat. The craziest thing is that the game only used 75% of the PlayStation's capabilities. When its sequel came out, it had over 700 cars, rally racing, refinements and more stuff. And despite being a better game, that was rushed. And that means more cut content, but that's another episode. Gran Turismo 3 is where I first embraced video games, and the first PS2 game my family had in our then expensive collection. I still play GT ever since, and it's nice to come back and fire up the greatest licensed soundtrack of all time, because it's so damn good. Hell, Gran Turismo is still going with the release of the 7th entry for both the PS4 and PS5 simultaneously, which is the first in the franchise. In the end, it isn't too much of a racer, but it's the real driving simulator, and don't you forget it. So we've delved into a demo, a bunch of betas, and on the next episode, we'll be looking at a bonafide cancelled title. The third episode will be the last one uploaded to Mace 2.0, and from the fourth one onwards, will be exclusive to Rabbit. So if you like it, hit the like. If you're interested, follow the White Rabbit. And as of now, I'll see you later. Bye.